All right, everybody. Now, today's book is The Art of War by Sung Tzu. Okay, this is a special edition, and I've read this book many times, but I'm going to read 11 pages of this one. And if it gets too crazy where I feel that we need to read something else, then we will read something else. But right now, what I want to do is I want to read The Art of War by Sung Tzu. And then I'm going to read uh, a couple other pages out of my other book. Because every day you should be reading 11 good pages of a book, okay? Uh, chapter 1, Laying Plans. Alright, so this is our today's book. This is uh, chapter 1. Song Tzu said, The art of war is of uh, vital importance to the state. 2. It is a matter of life and death, a road either to safety or to ruin. Hence, it is just a subject inquiry which can on no account be neglected. 3. The art of war then is governed by five constant factors to be taken into account in one's deliberations when seeking to determine the conditions obtaining in the field. Four, these are, for one, the law, the moral law, for two, heaven, for three, earth, for four, the commander, for five, method and discipline. Five and six, the moral law causes the people to be complete accord with the rulers, so that they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any anger. 7. Heaven signif uh, signifies night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons. 8. Earth comprises distance, great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes, the chances of life and death. 9. The commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage, and strictness. 10. By method and discipline are to be understood the marshalling of the army in its proper subdivisions, the graduations of rank among officers, the maintenance of roads by which supplies may reach the army, and control of military expenditure. Uh, expenditure. These five heads should be familiar to every general. He who knows them will be victorious. He who knows them not will fail. Therefore, in your deliberations, when seeking to determine the military conditions, let them be made the basis of comparison in this wise. 13. 1. Which of the two sovereigns is imbu with the moral law? 2. Which of two generals has most ability? 3. With whom lie the advantages derived from heaven and earth? 4. On which side is discipline most rigorously enforced? 5. Which army is stronger? 6. On which side are officers and men more highly trained? 7. In which army is there the greatest consistency both in reward and punishment? 14. By the means of these seven considerations, I can forecast victory or defeat. 15. The general that hearkens to my counsel and acts upon it will conquer. Let such a one be retained in command. The general that hearkens not to my counsel nor acts upon it will suffer defeat. Let such a one be dismissed. 16. While heading the profit of my counsel, avail yourself also of any circumstances over and beyond the ordinary rule. 17. According as circumstances are favorable, one should modify one's plans. 18. All warfare is based on deception. 19. Hence, when able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. 20. Hold out baits to entice the enemy. Find disorder and crush him. 21. If he is secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he is in superior strength, evade him. 22. If your opponent is of chloric temper, seek, an irate, seek to irate him. Pretend to be weak, that he may grow arrogant. 23. If he is taking his ease, give him no rest. If his forces are united, separate them. 24. Attack him where he is unprepared. Appear where you are not expected. These military devices leading to victory must not be divulged beforehand. 26. Know the general who wins in battle makes many calculations in his temple ere the battle is fought. The, be the general who loses the battle makes but few calculations before him. Thus, do many calculations lead to victory and few calculations to defeat? How much more... How much more no calculations at all. It is by attention to this point that I can foresee who is likely to win or lose. The Art of War. Sun Tzu said, A thousand ounces of silver per day, such is the cost of raising an army of a hundred thousand men. Chapter 2. Waging War. 
One, Sun Tzu said, in the operation of war, where there are in the fields of a thousand swift chariots, as many heavy chariots, and a hundred thousand mail-clad soldiers with provisions enough to carry them a thousand li. The expenditure at home and at the front, including entertainment of guests, small items such as glue and paint, and some spent on chariots and armor, will reach a total of a thousand ounces of silver per day. Such is the cost of raising an army of a hundred thousand men. Two, when you engage in actually fighting, if victory is long in coming, the men's weapons will go go uh, will grow dull, and their ardor will be damp. If you lay siege to a town, you will exhaust your strength. Again, if the campaign is protracted, the resources of the state will not equal to the strain. Four, now when your weapons are dull, your ardor damped, your strength exhausted, and your treasure spent, other chieftains will spring up to take advantage of your extremity then no man, however wise, will be able to avert the consequences that must ensue. 5. Thus, though we have heard of stupid haste in war, cleverness has never been seen associated with long delays. 6. There is no instance of a country having benefited for prolonged warfare. 7. It is only one who is thoroughly acquainted with the evils of war that can thoroughly understand the profitable way of carrying it on. 8. The skillful soldier does not raise a second levy, neither are his supply wagons loaded more than twice. 9. Bringing war material with you from home, but forged on the enemy. Thus the army will have food enough for its needs. 10. Poverty of the state extinguisher causes an army to maintain by contributors from a distance. Contributing to maintain an army at a distance causes the people to be impoverished. 11. On the other hand, the proximity of an army causes prices to go up and, and high prices cause people's substance to be drained away. 12. When their substance is drained away, the peasantry will be afflicted by heavy exactions. 13 and 14. With this loss of substance and exhaustion of strength, the homes of the people will be stripped bare and three-tenths of their income will be dissipated, while government expenses for broke chariots, worn-out horses, breastplates and helmets, bows and arrows, spears and shields, protective mantles, draught oxen, and heavy wagons will amount to four-tenths of its total revenue. 15. Hence, a wise general makes a point of forging on the enemy. The cartload of an enemy's provisions is equivalent to 20 of one's own, and likewise a single pickle of his provider is equivalent to 20 from one's own store. Wow, that's getting hard to say. 16. Now in order to kill the enemy, our men must rouse to anger, that there may be advantage from defeating the enemy. They must have their rewards. 17. Therefore in chariot fighting, when ten or more chariots have been taken, those should be rewarded who took the first. Our own flags should be substituted for those of the enemy, and the chariots mingled and used in conjunction with ours. The captured shoulders should be kindly treated and kept. 18. This is called using the conquered foe to argument one's own strength. 19. In war, then, let your great object be victory, not lengthy campaigns. 20. Thus it may be known that the leader of armies is the arbitrary of the people's fate. The man on whom it depends whether the nation shall be in peace or in peril. Suzan said, uh, Sun Tzu said, In the practical order of war, the best thing of all is to take the enemy's country whole and intact. Chapter 3. Sun Tzu said, In the practical art of war, the best thing of all is to take the enemy's country whole and intact. To shatter and destroy it is not so good. So, too, it is better to recapture an army's entire army entire than to destroy it. To capture a regiment, a detachment, or a company, entire them to destroy them. 2. Hence to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme ex ex eh, excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. 3. Thus the highest form of generalship is to bulk the enemy's plans. The next best is to prevent the, the junction of the enemy's forces. The next in order is to attack the enemy's army in the field. And the worst policy of all is to besiege walled cities. 4. The rule is not to besiege walled cities if it can possibly be avoided. The preparation of mantelless, movable shelters and various implements of war will take up three whole months, and the piling up of mounds over against the walls will take three months more. 5. The general unable to control his rations will launch his men to the assault like swarming ants with the result that one-third of his men are slain while the town still remains untaken. Such are the disastrous effects of a siege. 6. 
Therefore, the skillful leader subdues the enemy's troops without any fighting. He captures their city without laying siege to them. He overthrows their kingdom without lengthy operations in the field. 7. His forces intact will dispute the mastery of the empire, and thus, without losing a man, his triumph will be complete. This is the method of attacking by Stegogram. 8. It is the rule of war if our forces are 10 to the enemy's 1 to surround him. If it is... 5 to 1 to attack him, if a twice as numerous to divide our army into two. 9. If equal matched, we can offer battle. If slightly inferior in numbers, we can avoid the enemy. If quite unequal in every way, we can flee from him. 10. Hence thou an abstain fight may be made by a small force. In the end, it must be captured by the larger forces. 11. Now the general is the bulwark of the state. If the bulwark is complete at all points, the state will be strong. If the bulwark is defective, the state will be weak. 12. There are three ways in which a ruler can bring misfortune upon his army. 13. 1. By commanding the army to advance or to retreat, being ignorant of the fact that it cannot obey. This is called hobbling the army. 14. 2. By attempting to govern an army in the same way as he administers a kingdom, being in ignorant of the conditions which obtain in an army. This causes restlessness in the soldier's mind. 15.3. By employing the officers of his army without discrimination through ignorance of the military principle adaptions to circumstances. This shakes the confidence of the soldier. 16. When the army is restless and distrustful, trouble is sure to come from other feudal uh, princes. This is simply bringing anarchy into the army and fleeing victory away. 17. Thus we may know there are five essentials for victory. 1. He will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. Two, he will win who knows how to handle both superior and inferior forces. Three, he will win whose army is animated by the same spirit throughout all its ranks. Four, he will win who prepared himself, waits to take the enemy unprepared. Five, he will win who has military capacities and is not interfered with by the sovereign. Eighteen, hence the saying, if you know how the enemy... Henry, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Okay. And then we're going to stop there. Sun Tzu said, The good fighters of old first put themselves beyond possibilities of defeat and then waited for an opportunity to defeat the enemy. So we're on... Page 15 of that book. Okay. Now, regular book. Let me see where we at in this one. Got to find my page marker here. Did I not use a page marker? Might not have. Okay. I'll just start from chapter one. First lesson. This book here is chesty. I'm going to read it because I like to, when I read 11 pages, I like to read a couple different books so that it makes my mind, you know, you need to think about what you just read. So me, I'm going to read, I'm a Marine, so I like to read chesty, but I'm going to read it to you guys. First lesson, Lewis Burwell Poehler, what, this is uh, Marine, the life of Chesty Poehler, the only Marine in history to win five Navy crosses by Burke Davis. He was so tough even for the Marine Corps. He was too tough even for the Marine Corps. Chapter 1, First Lesson. Louis Bur Burwell Puller was born June 26, 1898 into a small boy's paradise, the village of West Point, Virginia, where the Pumaki and Monte Rivers form the broad York. The waters are full of fish, crab and oysters, and the woodlands teemed with game. West Point was a carnival town in summer. Excursions trains from Richmond bore thousands of, to Beach Park, a few yards from Puller's home, where they swarmed the bar rooms and gambling halls on the piers, rode the carousel and roller coasters, watched train bears, or spent noisy evenings in the skating rink and dancing hall. The village population was under a thousand, and the Pullers were among its first families, a matter of some importance to Virginians. Lewis was the oldest son of Matthew M. Puller, a wholesale grocer salesman who spent most of his time on the road in a buggy or train. A grandfather, John W. Puller, had been killed with Jeb Stewart in a cavalry fight at Kelly Ford in the Civil War, a gallant death of which Lewis was often told. The first Lewis Burwell, born in 
Bedfordshire in 1621 had come to Virginia as a sergeant major of a country military company to establish a notable line which included many members of his colony's house of Burgess. In contrast, there was also Lewis Burroughs Williams of Orange, Virginia, a kinsman who had been expelled from Princeton in 1821 for taking part in a riot. The family uh, persevered one document from this man and ordered to a British merchant for one barrel of whiskey, 12 decks of playing cards, and one English prayer book. There were many other noted relatives, Patrick Henry, Philip Ludwig, Rob, Robert Carter, John Grimes of the Governor's Council, one cousin, Paige McCarthy, a Confederate captain who, who fought the last legal duel in Virginia, killing his man over the reputation of a Richmond Bell. Louis Puller's great uncle, Robert Williams, a West Point graduate, deserted the South in the Civil War to command a federal division at Gettysburg, which fought against three of his brothers. The Virginia branch of the family never afterwards spoke to him, though he came to a new renown by marrying the widow of Stephen A. Douglas. Lewis Puller had another cousin who would become a famous soldier, George S. Patton. So Chesty Puller's cousin was George S. Patton. When Lewis was less than two years old, he won a beautiful baby contest in his village. And when a Richmond photographer chucked him under the chin in quest of a smile he got for his pains a belligerent scowl which was to change little in a lifetime he was quieter than most with a level openly curious gaze he kept his own counsel at the age of four or five he broke an arm in a fall and when he visited the doctor some weeks later for removal of the cast the physician shook his head explained that the bones were crooked and snapped them anew without warning the boy grimaced but uttered no sound Lewis learned to read earlier and devoured books on war and warriors that might have been beyond his youthful grasp, but for his impassionate interest in military life, he read G.A. Hen Henty's adventure novels with a relish he seemed to lose in the class in the schoolroom. Matthew Polar died in 1908 after a long battle with cancer, cheerful to the end. He was an erect, gray-eyed, and handsome man of medium height, a sporty dresser who liked Prince Albert and bought custom-made shoes from the city and carried a cane. He had little formal education. He had been raised on a farm by one of his father's cavalrymen after the Civil War. He drove himself to reading and was celebrated as a conversationalist, as well as a good man in a card game, like certain of his forebears. Lewis and his younger brother Sam were not allowed to go to the funeral, but when their mother and two sisters returned from the cemetery, the family's life was immediately changed. Mrs. Puller called the household into parlor, where she dismissed the Negro servants, a groom, a maid, and a nurse, explaining that she could no longer afford them. She asked the groom to sell the two horses and buggy and carriage. Lewis began trapping that winter without explaining the enterprise to his mother. He left the house before daylight each morning to visit traps he had buried in the half-frozen runways of muskets, muskrats in the river marshes. He sold the hides for 15 cents each and the carcasses for 5 cents to poor families in town. Much of the money went into the family treasury, but there was also a small fund for ammunition. He was hardly more than 12 when he killed the first wild turkey, quite by mistake and out of season. Alarmed, he stayed in the woods until nightfall, then took the bird to the home of a Negro woman who reassured him, Mr. Lewis, don't you bother your head about it. I'll pick him and dress him up nice and take him to your mama tomorrow, and she'll be pleased as punch. But Mrs. Puller was not pleased, and the next day gave Lewis a tongue lashing he long remembered. The small, wiry, reserved woman directed her family with uncompromising discipline, but never whipped the children. One of Lewis's companions was Dick Broadus, a year or so older, the son of the president of the local telephone company. Lewis often tossed pebbles against the third-floor bedroom window of young Broadus, and before daylight they rode with a Negro companion, one George, and the telephone company's buggy to the woods. George taught Lewis, when a rabbit runs away from you, don't try to shoot down on him or you'll sight too high and too low and miss him. Go right down with him. Kneel down and you'll get him every time. Before Lewis, before leaves fell, Lewis and Dick hunted squirrels alone. But after the frost, when trees were bare, they used dogs and learned to approach the, the blind sides of the trees where the squirrels hid. Lewis learned both accuracy and frugality for he bought his own ammunition. He seldom spoke on these trips until noon, when they sat on a log for a sandwich. He often talked of his dream of going to Virginia Military Institute and becoming a soldier. 
From his reading, his family's traditions, his love of hunting, fishing, and horseback riding, he was drawn to a military life in VMI. Fifty years later, at the end of the of a fighting career, he would look back at these days in the open. I learned more in the woods hunting and stalking about the actual art of war than I ever learned in any school of any kind. Those days in the woods as a kid saved my life many a time in combat. The Confederacy was still very much alive in the Tidewater, Virginia of Puller's boyhood. Once every week, a buggy halted before the Puller home and a stout, graying man with imperial bearing climbed out and moved up the walk with a basket on either arm. He was Captain Robert E. Lee, Jr., son of the revered Comfort General, now reduced to selling eggs and vegetables to support his family. Mrs. Puller unfa unfailingly bought food from him. Lewis's favorite Confederate was the mayor of West Point, Sergeant Willis Eastwood, who had ridden with him his grandfather in the Gray Calvary. Eastwood often told the boys of the death of their grandfather. You know, your granddaddy was elected colonel of the infantry in the country, but he wouldn't have it. He gave it up to be the captain in the horse troop. Everybody wanted to ride in that war. We carried shotguns and squirrel rifles and any kind of pistol we had. They, spear, they speared. Some of them lanced. We called them, but they were just bayonets stuck on the poles. I remember riding in the Richmond with the troop, going to join Jeb Stewart, and we were too proud that it killed us to hear the little boys on the sidewalk yell us, Dog catchers! The place they killed your granddaddy was Kelly's Ford, up on the Rap Knock. And it was on the 13th of the March in the 1863, just one night before he told me no many ball had been made that could kill him. But the Yankees came pointing across the river when they weren't looking and caught us with our britches down. Jeb Stewart was late getting out there, and we lost plenty of fine boys. One of them was Major John Peelman, the gunner. You know all about him. Well, your granddaddy, the major, was riding for the Yankee cannon, just behind General Rosser. Then the general yelled without turning around. He said, For God's sake, Puller, help me rally the men. And your granddaddy could hardly speak. But he said, General, I think I'm killed. The general turned and saw that it was true. Your granddaddy fell off the horse dead, and nobody knows this day how he stayed in the saddle with that wound so long. Cannon fire. It just tore his middle right out of him, all his lights and everything. What kind of man do you think it took to ride hurt as bad as that? I'm proud to remember that I was his sergeant major. The rest of the story was often told at home. Lewis's grandmother had hung on her parlor wall the sword and spurs of her husband, but a few months after his death, a raiding party of federal soldiers glimpsed these mem mementos, burned her house under an order to destroy Confederate munitions. The widow walked the 10 miles to Gloucester Cowhorse in a sleet storm, dragging four-year-old Matthew Polder with one hand and carrying his two-year-old brother. Within a few days, she was dead of pneumonia. Lewis's mother invariably ended the story with a moral. Boys, you must be proud of the Confederacy, but it's a mighty good thing that the United States won that war as terrible as it was. We wouldn't live except as one people. There were pictures of great Confederates in the Polar home, Lee, Jackson in, in particular, but there was an older hero too, from Caesar to Gazesta Adolf. When his mother first read to him the Genghis Khan, Lewis was so smitten that on his next trip to Richmond, he bought a book about the Mongol conqueror from his ammunition hoard. There too, he saw his first parade of Confederate veterans with the still erect figure of General B. Gordon at the head of the shuffling thousands of aging men in gray. The city had been turned over to them, and many were so far gone and drank that they toppled from windows or lay in the streets while their patriots marched before cheering crowds. Young Lewis had an almost clinical interest in these war veterans, and once asked Sergeant Eastwood, but how did we lose that, the war when there were so many of them left alive? We didn't fight until everybody was dead. I wouldn't have given up. Eastwood gave him a long look. Boy, you're John Polar's grandson. I can see that. Flesh and blood. It's a neck and nothing with you, Polars. Lewis got into a few fist fights for the demonstrated that he would fight to the finish, whatever the odds. One day, when Sam Puller picked up a fight with an older friend, Dave Field, Lewis stood by and watched Field pound his brother into a submission. But when the larger boys, Wayland's friends, Lewis organized a neighborhood gang and took revenge. After Mr. Puller's death, Lewis built a boxing ring in the empty stables of the barn, and a dozen or more boys fought there in the afternoons after school. Lewis was not quite 15 when... As the head of the family, he gave away his elder sister, Emily, in marriage. 
In the next summer, he worked in a new pulp mill in town, an average of 12 hours a day at 15 cents an hour. He became a merchant on his own initiative. He bought steam crabs from a nearby packing house and stood among Negro huskers at the gates of the beach park, selling crabs for 25 cents a dozen. The money went to his mother. Mrs. Polar managed well on the limited income. She insisted upon the best education with her means for our four children, occasionally with Veminus. Once when the West Point School pr uh, proposed the dropping of Latin from the curriculum, she organized a parental posse and had the subject retained. Lewis was grateful, but not for consideration of pure scholarship. His efforts at translating Caesar made him impatient for the true message of the soldier's author, and when he bought a pony in Richmond, he was fascinated by the narrative war that he devoured it in one night. It opened a new world for him and began a lifelong career of serious military reading. When Lewis was a junior in high school, West Point formed its first football team, though only two of the players had so much as seen a game. The 140-pound Lewis became fullback and manager. The team was equipped in spite of handicaps. The local harness maker split horse collars to make so shoulders and knee pads. Shoes were Boy Scout 